Good evening, everyone. Uh, do you hear me okay? If you can switch the chat to panelists and, um, no, not panelists, everyone, which means all panelists and attendees. Okay, Kirill hears me, that is excellent. Right, while, we, while people are still joining and very happy to see you again, uh, I, I see there is some correlation between how good the weather is and how many people we have attending. So the sunnier the weather, the less people attend, which is okay, it's life. <laughs> um, but basically, while people are still joining, uh, we will start with data structures very shortly. I am wondering if any of you have any questions on the previous uh, topics, uh, like control structures, pattern matching, four comprehensions, all that. And uh, I will try to help you and answer them while you, um, uh, while we wait for everyone to join. The other thing is, um, is there anyone here who has not attended any of the previous workshops? And if so, please write in the chat and um, at least we will know that there is someone who is here for the first time. Because the expectation is, hi Andres, uh, the expectation is that you are able to run the project, the tests on the project. So basically when you run data structure spec, like I do now, I hope the screen sharing works. My hope and expectation is that at that point, uh, all the tests run and all the tests fail from data structures spec. That is the hope and expectation. Okay, well, let's start. <clears throat> Uh, and, and if you do figure out some questions on the previous topics, then please write in chat. We will try to cover them. So data structures. Let's discuss uh, main data structures in Scala, the most commonly used. Of course, you can maybe use some other ones or some third party libraries implementing some other ones. Uh, but uh, the standard Scala data structures, they fit into two categories, mutable and immutable collections. And uh, I'm wondering if you can maybe write in chat, uh, what do you think? Which ones should we use and when? Like what are the considerations that you're aware of? Okay, Vitaly thinks we should use both depending on situation, but mostly mutable. Vitaly, wh why do you think so? I don't disagree, but but why why do you think so? Oh, am I mute? Yes, uh, so Vitaly says immutable data structures lead to less bugs. We always know the condition, Sergei says. So Igor says immutable most times. Uh, this mutable is not a side effect. It could be more efficient. I wonder what you mean by this mutable is not a side effect. But overall, I agree. So in general, you want to default to immutable data structures because they're easier to reason about and um, easier to uh, 
you you have less chances of getting uh, accidentally sharing them between threads, and then it turns out that one of your threads is corrupting data for another of your threads, uh, and these sort of uh, issues lead to uh, lead to very nasty bugs, which are difficult to debug and find. Uh, so immutable data structures are safer in that way, and the default would be to use immutable ones. Uh, of course, if you have done your profiling and you know that for some reason your immutable data structure is inefficient for what you want to do, then using uh, mutable data structures, uh, especially if working with them is well encapsulated, like your clients don't even know what you're doing within your methods, uh, it's okay. It, 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 it can happen sometimes, but in general, you want to have some evidence that your immutable data structures are not applicable before you do that. So, <clears throat> we will mostly be using immutable data structures in this uh, segment. Uh, so, some examples of mutable data structures. So, this is list buffer. Uh, which is a mutable list basically, and you can update it. And here you can see you update at an index, an element at an index. So this would be its zero index. So this would be the second element that you updated. And you can make a guess of what the resulting list buffer, buffer is gonna be after this update. And uh, in my opinion, it will be this. So the end result is gonna be um, of this update operation is going to be a list buffer with these contents. Um, and then we have an immutable list. And here, instead of a method update, we have a method updated, which returns a new list with the relevant uh, data, with the relevant element changed. Again, we again have a, a list of... Uh, with the same contents, except our immutable list one hasn't changed. In this case, we update and the mutable list changed. In this case, it didn't change. Um, and we can check that the contents are actually the same. Arrays are uh, basically a scholar representation of Java arrays. They're again, zero indexed. Um, and you can read the third element. And you can update the fourth element here and set it to seven. And actually, I think you have, you have a way, like if you don't know, like there is no hundreds element. So you can say array lift hundred and it's gonna return none, even though array uh, lift so let's 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 do a wild guess. What will array lift three gonna return in this case? Please write in uh, chat. What will array lift three return here? Okay, Igor makes a guess that it's going to be a seven. Okay, any other ideas from anyone else? Okay, Yelena is closer than Igor and Vitali, but it's not exactly right, but certainly Yelena is closer than Igor and Vitali. I'm hoping that someone else is still either adjusting the previously given answer. Yes, Igor, it's sum of seven. So the correct answer is sum of seven, because uh, 
we do have a force element in this array. Oh yes, uh, Yelena, you need, okay, actually, Yelena, you need to change the addressee of your messages to everyone or all panelists and attendees. Then everyone will see your uh, answers. Otherwise they, uh, they, uh, they lose context. Okay, so that's arrays. So here we get to lists. Um, so I think we mentioned previously already last time uh, that you can define lists in a couple of ways. You can define like a list of one, two, three, and you can define a list of one, two, three like this using the cons operator. And um, prepending to a list is quite fast. And also for immutable lists, prepending the list, it doesn't copy the whole list, it just uh, prepends one element and returns basically like a pointer, a reference to that one element. Um, and these two ways how to define a list are the same. There's actually also in the cats library, there's also a so-called non-empty list. Um, and you can, um, you can define a non-empty list here as well, uh, which is going to be a list, which is always going to have at least one element. So that's also sometimes used. Oh, uh, Vitaly is saying he didn't get why it's sum of seven. So lift is a safe, indeed, Igor, lift is a safe operation, which returns option. So if it's an option, it's always going to be either a sum or a none because option is a, a, a sum type, uh, which is either a non or a sum um, returning some value. And actually this lift is, is from a, um, it actually comes from a partial function. It's not from array in particular, but in case of array, uh, this is how it works. Uh, so if it returns an option, then it must return either sum or none. In this case, you know, in case of index 100, which wasn't present in this array, it's none. In case of three, it's a sum of seven. Yeah, that's that's the thing. You kind of want to uh, you want to click and 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 see these return types because they are always uh, very uh, useful in Scala. Um, Okay, so then we have three ways how to define empty lists. And we have some basic list operations. This is prepending to a list using the cons operator, I believe that's what it's called. Um, and we can return the tail of a list which is basically dropping the first element and returning the elements after the first one. And tail is not a safe operation. So tail, if I remember right, is gonna throw an exception if the list is empty. So in general, you don't want to invoke tail willy nilly. I mean, you can do tail if you just did a pattern match and you, or you, you know that the list is uh, gonna have elements. But uh, in the general case, uh, you don't want to just invoke tail if you know if it's gonna, might uh, uh, throw in an exception. Um, you want to guard it within a pattern match or something, so, uh, or check that it's not empty. So you can concatenate lists using the street column operators. Um, so I have a question here. So if we have an empty list and we call head on it, what's going to happen here? Like what is this, um, what is going to be the value of this uh, variable um, head of list one? And how is it going to end up being that value? Like what is actually going to happen behind the scenes here? Any ideas?
Okay, Yuris thinks that there is going to be a failure. And Yuris, how are we going to get to that failure? Like what, what is going to be happening behind the scenes so we get this uh, failure? Like who's going to, what's going to ensure that we got the failure? Try catch, except we don't, well, we, we kind of don't see a try catch here. Where's the try catch? I mean, there's no catch here. Yeah, inside, inside the try. Okay, so basically, if we add the types, okay, we see that the type of this one is a try. And if it's a try, it's going to be one of success or failure. So what's going to be happening here? The empty list head, because it's empty, uh, head of an empty list of, of the nil is going to be throwing no such element exception. And the try is going to catch that and convert it into a failure. So it's going to be a failure to a no such element exception. And that's what's going to be a value here. So in general, you don't want to work with exceptions unless you're forced to due to legacy code. So instead, you would usually use head option unless, again, you've, you're doing it uh, in general, you would always want to use head option unless your uh, your your code makes it explicit that there's always going to be a non-empty list here. Like uh, if this is going to be this uh, non-empty list, uh, then on this one, you could for sure call head because this head is always going to succeed on a non-empty list. Um, but uh, but in the general case, on a on a normal list, you don't want to call uh, head. Instead, of you want to call head option. Igor is asking why is there no tail option? That is a good question, and I was just wondering that two minutes ago because when we were discussing tail and how we shouldn't just call tail. I don't know if you noticed, I actually went and looked for tail option, didn't find it. Um, <laughs> but in general, a lot of the work with lists is in, if you want to do things like this, uh, you quite often do something like this. Uh, So you're kind of following this pattern where you are pattern matching on the list. And in case it's nil or empty, then you do whatever you want to do with the empty list. And in case it has something, then here you're basically splitting it into a head and a tail. And the head, in this case, because you did already do the empty list case statement, this is always going to be present. And now this one, it's never going to fail with an exception. It might sometimes still be empty if it's a, okay, let's, let's actually ask you, in which case, if you're invoking this sort of match case construct on a list, in which case the XS is going to be nil? What has to happen for the XS to be nil? Okay, Yuri says if it's one element. Yes, indeed. If immutable list two was one element, then X would be that one element and XS is going to be nil. That's a, a quite a common pattern working with uh, lists in, uh, in languages which like working with lists like uh, Scala or Haskell. I have a question to you now. So you Yeah, we missed an apply feature in control structures. We didn't go into that. We were just kind of using it and not really explaining it in detail. Uh, and Vitaly is suggesting that we 
uh, read Stack Overflow, but why there is no Stack of Tail option in Scala? Yeah, okay, thanks. That's that's a useful that's a useful link. Thank you, Vitaly. Okay, so my question to you is: We have nil, uh, we have none, uh, we have nothing, uh, we have null. All sorts of these different things, which all begin with the letter N, uppercase or lowercase, all seem to do something. Why so many? What do they each do? Uh, you can, uh, I guess you can pick, uh, each of you pick one and explain what it does in chat and try to pick one that hasn't been explained. And if you accidentally picked one which has been explained already by someone else, then pick some other one. Just uh, because it's, it's quite important to be able to distinguish. I think a lot of people initially, when they learn Skull, they are, these sort of constructs all map to too few constructs and the distinction between them gets lost. I think, Yuris, your explanation is okay, except the last part. When you say that the rest of them are objects, uh, I'm not sure all of them are actually objects. I think one of them isn't, doesn't count as an object. Okay, uh, Yuris says nothing is some pseudo thing, which is, it's a fair assessment, but I think it's imprecise. We can do, uh, we can characterize it more precisely. Yes, Yana, none is used in option. That's good. What is it used for in option? Okay, Vitaly, you could say that. Okay, so my explanation, again, maybe there's possibilities to be more precise about this, but nil, that's an empty list. Uh, so, list with no elements. Um, none, that's an empty option. That's an, an option which doesn't contain value. And these are both uh, one of the possible values. So, so, um, so yeah, you, you could have like list can have other possible values and option can have the sum value. Uh, nothing special type with no possible values. And null um, only instance of null type equivalent to Java null. So that's my explanation. If you, Igor is asking, compiler could distinguish between expectation of the same name is used. I don't understand, but I don't think you want to call things the same name, even if uh, the compiler can distinguish them, because it's not just the compiler who is reading your code, it's also other uh, humans. Um, okay, if you have any questions on these definitions, if you have any questions on the subjects on to date, then, uh, then, then 
say. Otherwise, we'll proceed with vectors, sets, and maps, and then I think we'll have some exercises. It would be good to get to these exercises. Um, okay. So vectors are kind of like lists, but they have faster uh, random access. They have uh, effectively constant time random access and updates. Uh, and um, fast uh, prepend uh, and append, but they're immutable. So vectors are uh, vectors are interesting, and uh, I think I forgot the English name how they're implemented. I think they're like uh, tri trees, if you can say this. Um, so they have a quite an interesting internal representation memory, uh, which is which is good to read about. Sets are data structures which don't contain duplicate elements. Um, so if you try to add, uh, if you have a set of vegetables and you say vegetables two, and you try to add the same uh vegetable which was already there then you get the same thing uh basically this set and this set is going to be the same but if for some reason you add the american version of tomatoes then they're different uh, you're going to have six values in this vegetables two instead of five values in this one and you can check whether uh, a set contains the value. You can add values and you can remove values to the set, but because they're immutable, these sets, the immutable ones, um, you always get a new set. My question to you is, what do you think? Uh, how does Scala check what's um how does scala check that whatever you want to add the object you want to add to the set that it's equal to something that's already there like what does scala use to do that Yes, so um, indeed, Yuris, it is using Java hash code. Well, no, actually, it's not using Java hash code. It's using Java equals, right? Uh, but uh, it is also using Java hash code. So it's kind of <laughs> same as in Java, your equals and hash code should always be consistent. You can't have uh, two objects which are equals uh, their equals is uh, true but their hash codes are different because you can get then inconsistent uh, data uh, structures but otherwise it's 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 using the same equals and hash code uh, functions that uh, all uh, java objects have and of course it seems extremely natural if you are coming from a Java background, because you know, yes, that's what Java does for I don't know twenty years already, or however many, uh, twenty-four. Um, but um, but if you are not coming from a Java background, then I think that's a very important point that uh, what the set is using, it's using a combination of uh, uh, like tomatoes 
hash code and uh, tomatoes equals tomatoes and um, to check if a set already contains an element and it's not going to add it again if if it does so it basically it, it's relevant if you're building your own um, data structures uh, and want to add them to sets then you have to make sure you um, you are defining equals and hash code in the way that you want to define them. Now for case classes, they're defined automatically, but uh, for objects, they're not. So basically if you work with sets, there's a big difference. If you say case class person, um, ID string something something UID, or if you say uh, class person, ID UID, uh, name string because uh, by default for this person one which is a case class it's going to be using uh, equals and hash code of all the underlying um, values to implement automatically the equals and hash code of this case class while for class it's going to be using whatever you define. And if you don't define, it's going to be using uh, object uh, reference equality. And that could often get you completely different results than what you expected. This is, this is I think, important to know for, for those without an extensive Java background. Or, or um, OK. Then we have maps. Maps are key value pairs. In some languages, they're called dictionaries uh, and uh, I think sets in some languages are called bags but um, but um, these are key value pairs again there's actually two ways how to define them this is by uh, tuples so each key value pair is a tuple and this is actually the same thing but this is a most uh, frequently used way because it's a bit more clear. It quite clearly illustrates this uh, relationship between the key of tomatoes and four of the value. And again, you can um, add um, to a mutable map. You can add another uh, or redefine a value of, for a key, or you can remove a key value from an immutable map and again, get a new um, value, a new map. Uh, and then my question to you actually is, I am here adding two maps, vegetable weights and vegetable prices. And I'm calling it questionable map. Why did I call it questionable map? What, uh, like if you would see this in your own code, uh, what would you think? Well, not maybe your own code and code in your project. Someone else has written. Yes, here is very good answer. Actually, values are inconsistent. It's a mix of weights and values, and olives and olives weight is going to be overwritten by the price. And um, indeed, very good answer by Yuris. This is exactly we're mixing weights and prices, and and one is overwriting the other. So, any ideas what we could actually do in Scala? Like, how would we like? This seems to be the sort of bug that could sometimes happen. Well, of course, maybe not if you're working with simple maps with olives and cucumbers, 
on, on, on toy examples, but in real life, how could you avoid this? Any ideas? I, uh, I'm not sure I'm able to, I am not sure I have the import actually. So let's see, how did we do this? I'm actually not fully sure I remember this, but let's see. That's not actually what I wanted. Um, uh, let's see. I'm trying to add so-called tag types. What is it? Hate that, that values. It's actually hating it now. You map values. Okay, fine. Oops. Okay. So I am now hoping that if we start doing uh, this, that if we will try here to, I'm actually not sure this is what's gonna happen, but let's check. It didn't actually. Uh, let's see. Right, so, okay. So the thing is, this one ended up being map of string and int. So if we now try to make this one into a map of string of price, it is gonna fail because it's gonna say that one of them is not a price. And if we now here try to make this one into a string of uh, of map of string to weight, it's gonna fail because it's gonna say one of these is not a string of weight. If instead we were adding the same things, I think it's gonna succeed. First, let's check that it actually does work. So here we actually have the view, which is kind of bad. So. Hmm. This is kind of interesting. I didn't actually get the results that I wanted. <laughs> uh, it's something interesting happened with these views. Any ideas? We can turn it into a map. Okay, okay. So we could turn this one into a map because we get a view out of this one. Let's see if we can turn this one into a map. So my expectation is that this is gonna fail and it didn't. Oh, I think it did, it failed. Uh, let's see, let's. Here I have this extra symbol. Let's see what actual compilation errors I'm getting here. I'm expecting that these two should fail to compile because we are adding. Okay. Uh, 
I'm expecting that these two are gonna fail because we're adding now oh, this one. Oh. Because we're adding mismatch types. Okay. Hmm. Right. Okay. So this one failed because we were trying to convert it from string to price when these are both weights. So instead, we will change this one to weight, and we hope that this is going to succeed. And these two, we are expecting that they will fail because those are wrong types now. So right now we're actually getting a tick bit longer because I was improvising. Um, so the compiler, now that we use these shapeless uh, tag types, the compiler did allow us to add two of the weights and say that this is a map of string to weight but it didn't allow us to merge map of string to weight with string to price and assign it to either string of price or string of weight. And it will also not allow us to add to this okay map. We cannot add, we basically have to know what we're adding. We uh, cannot add this because it doesn't, well, maybe it does cost it. We certainly cannot, hmm, did allow us because it, 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 it did allow us that, but we cannot, if we have a price here, let's assume a price. So this is now a price. It will not allow us to put this price, or does it? No, it doesn't. So, huh? it's kind of interesting. Hmm. It's actually really interesting. Okay, I don't think the experiment was super successful, um, but the end result is the following, that if you use the tag types correctly, uh, then uh, you can distinguish between uh, various um, ints. So you, you can make sure you don't mix your weights with your prices, even though they're all are ints. Um, but, uh, I guess uh, we will return to this at some later point, maybe uh, in the um, in the workshops, and maybe this time it's actually going to work as I expect. Um, okay, uh, let's do this. Um, let's do the exercise: total vegetable cost uh, int. The task is to calculate the cost of all vegetables taking vegetable units from vegetable, uh, vegetable amounts in units from vegetable amounts and prices per unit from vegetable prices. So you want to calculate the total um, cost of all vegetables. And if the price is not available, then you use 10. And I think there is a useful, uh, I think there is a useful method called get or else. So key and default. So you can use that one. That is, uh, that is the current exercise. If you have any questions on the exercise, uh, let me know. By the way, the simpler way besides using shapeless tags is you can do a case class weight, uh, extends any val. 
So that's another option how to do this. It does come that, yes, that's a good suggestion, Yuris. Uh, for, for some reason, I didn't go there. I wanted to uh, suffer a bit more. Um, but uh, this one actually does do some wrapping and unwrapping. Uh, if, if you use it in collections, sometimes it doesn't like, in some operations, this extends any well means that this actually is being compiled to optimized by the uh, Scala compiler to primitive ints. And in some other uh, cases, it isn't. So uh, it does come with some performance costs comparing to, uh, to the int, but... Um, So if you have any questions on this task, then, then uh, let me know. Otherwise, otherwise uh, just post your solutions in the chat. Okay, Igor. Um, I mean, thank you, Yelena. Your solution 
looks quite nice. Um, is it, does it do what? Yes, it seems like it does what it should do, I guess. I'm kind of wondering Like, Yelena, in your case, I'm kind of wondering why are you mapping to I'm kind of wondering why you're mapping to tuples if you're then just going to discard the keys. And in your case, Igor, I'm wondering why are you using the underscore one and underscore two? Um, syntax if uh, maybe it's not very readable and i think you can do the destructuring already in the variable definitions Okay, well, let, let, let's try. I'm not saying that's going to succeed. Let's let's try to adjust Igor's solution first. So what is it even? Why is it complaining here? Oh, no, wait, wait, wait. I was, I put it in the wrong place. Sorry. It can't do that actually. Okay, fine. Well, sometimes it can. Um, So maybe something like this is a bit more readable in this case. Is anyone else still working on the on the task? Or has anyone else who hasn't posted? Okay. So Yelena's solution, uh, I would Maybe, am I wrong in thinking that we can just do this? And I think this is gonna be the same thing, really. Okay, it's not actually complaining. Uh, so, sorry about the, this, distracting everyone. I did make some changes to this um, tag types thing. I introduced some smart constructors here in the companion objects uh, to make this part more readable. And here is like an example which tells you that you cannot add prices and weights. So you create a price here and you create a weight here and you cannot add prices and weights. And, uh, and as expected, these maps are, are not, you cannot add these uh, weight maps with uh, prices maps. You are not getting consistent maps out of it. But um, I will um, I will now comment all this and let's try to run the. So total vegetable cost actually succeeded. That was Yelena's version, I think, which I removed the the values.
so I, I think this is uh, this is a good version. This is this is really quite readable. If anyone has finished the task, then you can actually do the next one. But uh, actually, we still have people posting solutions to total vegetable. Uh, yes, Vitaly. So, so basically, you are kind of dragging the key and then you're discarding it. Values is going to discard all the keys. And so you could just not generate them. Like you don't have to generate them. You can just use them to retrieve the prices. We are approaching the time uh, limit for today. I think my proposal would be that we finish with these total vegetable costs and total vegetable weights uh, functions for today and call it a day on that. Uh, we have a bit more material and two more uh, complicated um, tasks uh, still in this section. But I think let's wrap it up uh, with total vegetable cost and total vegetable weights. So you can proceed with total vegetable weights. So Hudis, in your case, same as for Igor, I would suggest that you at least learn how to do this without using underscore one and underscore two, because in general, it's, frowned upon because it's not a very readable way. After a while, you get quite uh, unreadable code if you overuse this uh, underscore one and underscore two syntax. I think um, that uh, Yuris, you will find the current solution, which is mostly, I think, Yelena's, which I, uh, I, I took and modified a tiny bit. Uh, you will find it interesting because I think it does exactly what you, uh, what you wanted to do using this case syntax. I, I think I think this is exactly what you're looking for, Yuris. Well, yes, extra case, but
So Vitaly, you implemented total vegetable weights and it didn't really work. Is that what you're saying? You're saying the tests failed. May I ask a silly question? Why are you doing get or else with a two? Why are you assuming that the default is a two? Do any of you have any other questions on the topics we covered today or in previous lectures or any of the tasks and the, just write because basically uh, we will be wrapping up after these exercises. I'm actually gonna get the survey. One second, I'm gonna find the survey. This is the survey, which we would appreciate to fill out. It has actually a question on homework because uh, the previous survey said that some people would like some homework. And uh, I guess the question is how many of you would like homework? While we're not giving any homework, what I would suggest as homework is go to hackerrank.com and just start doing exercises in Scala. Because most of them are really about um, the topics we covered. Like the topics we covered are usually sufficient to solve those uh, exercises. And then you can also submit them and uh and look at what other people have done in scala and how they have solved i know that uh sometimes that can show you some better ways how to solve things or teach you some more efficient library methods which make everything simpler and cleaner
Okay, so I uh, did here. I mean, don't look if you are still solving the total vegetable weights tasks, but I uh, um, did two ways how they could be done. One was a four comprehension, and one was a combination, you know, a de-sugared four comprehension flat map and map. Okay, so Vitalis, does this actually pass the tests? Because I'd be surprised if it does. It does, and we have to improve the tests. <laughs> uh, because the thing is, uh, I think the exercise says that if known, it's basically saying if known, it doesn't say if not known, assume that it's uh, zero. It just says calculate for those vegetables where the values are known. And zeros are filtered out. Wow. Oh, yes, yes, Vita. Oh, Andres, good point, actually. Yes, Vitalis is afterwards filtering out the zeros. Right, I did notice at first. Igor, I really like your solution. I think Vitaly, your solution still in a way has bugs because what if we have some vegetables for which we know the, uh, the um, amount is zero? I mean, our tests don't really catch this situation. We should improve the tests. But, uh, but if the amount is known to be zero, you are gonna uh, skip it when in fact it should be present in results because it is known. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Well, okay, let's take a look. Um, yeah, we have to, um, hmm. well, the problem is we have to turn it into a method then. Let, let, let's do that. Let's turn it into a method and write a test. So in this method, we will place Vitaly's solution.
Oops, what did I do here? So we tell you, keep me honest. If I've misrepresented your solution, then then you tell me. Okay. So now let's write a test for this one. So Vitaly, do you think this is a fair test? Like, is this fairly testing, um, fairly testing what you, uh, what we should expect to do? Okay, so here we have this thing, sorry. Let's check. Yeah, we have the problem where, Copy paste from this uh, thing didn't it includes some garbage symbols? Wow, how do we do this? This is very sad that we have to do this, but it includes some uh, some incorrect symbols, and it still does them. So where are they hiding? <laughs> hmm. Any ideas where are these evil two zero two eight characters hiding? This is fun. Yeah, this is excellent, actually. I don't understand where these values are hiding. These 2028. Yeah, you can... Uh, you can send on Slack, Vitaly. Maybe it's going to paste it better from Slack, if, if you could. Okay. So let's try this. Okay, so do you see Vitaly here, the test, it's a fair test. We sh should be having these zeros, um, A of zero, because it is known that the weight is zero and the amount is zero, but it's instead of filtering them out. If instead we replace the solution with a different one, uh then it's gonna pass so hold on let me do the different one let me do this one yep. 
So now the test is gonna pass. Think. Yep. So basically, this one passes and this one fails because it filters out the zeros. Because it's kind of replacing, it's kind of representing not known with a zero, when in fact, zero could still be valid, certainly for uh, amounts, if not for, um, for weights, maybe for weights, we would think, okay, it should always be positive. Uh, yeah, let's, well, let's, I mean, let's, let's try. But the thing is, if we do this, then we can't multiply anymore because this is an option. So instead we kind of have to do the, well, we kind of have to do something else. Um, so instead, I mean, I think this is the most elegant way with the four comprehension. And you have to note that it is the same thing as this. Like when you de-sugar this four comprehension, you get this combination of flat map and map. And here we are doing the get which you suggested, but we are mapping here and we are only returning this uh, p value pair in case uh, the amount is present. Yes, Igor, exactly. You're quite right. So when this is going to be returning a none, then this flat map is not going to include it in the results. If instead it was a map, it wouldn't compile because it would say that we have an option of these string in tuples. But here it, it, it works. So any questions on today's topics at all? Uh, Vitaly, we didn't actually finish basics. We have still a bit left in data structures, but this bit includes two exercises which include a fair amount of, uh, of coding, so it will take a bit of time. And uh, Andres kindly agreed to do the algebraic data types lecture, and he's preparing that. So we will have, a, we will have more seminars. We will have... A, I'm thinking next one, maybe we will finish data structures. And then if we have time on the next one, we will just like take random hacker rank uh, tasks and solve them together uh, using Scala, if we have time on that lecture. And then the one after that is gonna be um, algebraic data structures. That's my idea. But if you have better suggestions, then, uh, then let me know. Is there anyone who wants to, I don't know, give voice commentary? I can uh, give uh, voice rights uh, if, if, if you raise hand or write in chat. I'm actually gonna just click allow to talk on everyone because we're wrapping up anyway, you can ask voice questions. And uh, thank you so much for, um, for attending. <laughs> yeah, home task would be make an account in hacker rank. Uh, so thank you so much for um, for attending. Please fill out the survey. And uh, and if you have any uh, topics you want to discuss, then just unmute yourselves. And I think everyone now has uh, voice voice rights to uh, to ask voice questions. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, see you next time. Have a great evening.